Good afternoon. Thank you, Pastor Dennis and, and Pastor Lori and church. Don't you appreciate churches that are on the move? And people that are on the move in general. I like being the weak, weakest link in the band. I like to be the weakest guy on the stage and in the, and in the setting because I grow that way. And I've learned, uh, I think it's been beaten out of me by some of the pastors I've worked for that I need to be the strongest guy on the stage. And uh, just let me go ahead and qualify. This old voice is a little rough because yesterday, day before yesterday, I came in early to be with a friend, and his son, 11-year-old, talked me into a game of I, uh, street hockey with the neighborhood kids. Uh, I scored three goals. I have two gashes in my right knee. My ankle is swollen, right ankle is swollen twice the size. And uh, my, right, my left thumb is a little slow. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at my guitar notes going, my goodness, it's not usually this hard to do this. <clears throat> and then uh, the brisk air, I, it was 75 degrees in Mississippi when I left. It's 25 this morning. So the old voice is a little raspy, and uh, I got that preacher voice. Oh, God, you know. So maybe I'll do a little preaching today. Does that work for you? Oh. So, I, I, but I love, I love what I feel um, in this place. I love the camaraderie, but also I was telling uh, David a moment ago, you know, just what a brilliant mind, and number one. Number two, just that sometimes we... We're in the trenches, and, and the tech people and the camera folks are the new soldiers. You're the new foot soldiers, and uh, for years it was just the praise team. You know, we showed up, and warmed up, played a little bit, and it was okay, but it wasn't great. And there were no cameras, and there were no really sound people or any of that stuff. It, it, we, you know, Brother Joe did the sound. But he also was an usher, and, um, you know, and I was at a church just recently, and, and the, the soundboard was still in the closet. They didn't have a soundboard in the room with the, with the church. So I had to hook up, and, and they guessed at what I would sound like, you know, and, and I guess we got through it, and we had church, and somehow people were touched. And I've, I've decided that uh, I have nothing to do with any of that. Just show up. Somebody say that. Just show up. That may be my first point today. Just show up. But my second point is to be prepared. Because you, you, can, you can dig deep out of a deep well, and you can, you can give out of your experience, and that's probably what you're going to get from me today. But then there's that factor of just showing up in the Holy Spirit. Like, I didn't anticipate that we would do what we just did. In fact, we rehearsed other songs. And I did a little doodle there and tried to wake up this hand on the front. But then we went into Open the Eyes of My Heart. We had that planned. But after that, I, you know, just going right out of that into what a beautiful name and sensing God's presence. You don't need a haze machine, Pastor. It was in the room. I looked up, and there was just a nice haze in the room. And, uh, and that's just the, it's just the presence of the Lord. And there's no machine putting that out. Am I right? So... Knowing the difference. Okay. Um, I, do, I do want to bring a scripture right from the start, if I might. Acts chapter 2, and you're mostly pastors and leaders, so I don't have to read and they don't have to put it up on the, on the screens. But the Bible says that when they were all in one mind, in one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven. To me, what I, I, and you, this is what you get when you put me in in-ears. I kind of get lost to myself, and I lose sight of the whole audience. I don't know if I even looked up. At, at one point, I remember looking out, and some of you had your hands in the air, and I said, that's it. We're in the right place. But I kind of get lost with, with earbuds in my ears because I feel like I'm separated from the room. I'm in the studio. Now I'm having a personal worship experience, you know. God's moving on me. I sense his presence, and if you want to go with me, that's pretty, pretty cool. If you don't, then you're looking at me like, uh, you know, a screech owl looking through a thorn bush. That guy's really odd. I like him. I don't know why. Right? But because most of us come to judge the worship instead of worship. 
If you come to judge the worship, you've already lost the battle. And that's really tough, especially for us folks who, are, who have our hands on the dials and on the knobs and on the guitars. And, but if you, if you come to judge the worship, you, you didn't come to worship. So Acts, the sound happens that comes, number one, from heaven. Those people were waiting for 10 days in that room. I've been up in the, uh, some of you have been in the upper room in Jerusalem or what they have designated as a potential place. <clears throat> and it's just a, you know, just a stone room. It echoes a lot. You can sing up there. It's probably not the place. But I remember being there on, I've been to Israel 12 times. And I remember being there with different tour groups as a worship leader. One group was a, a liturgical, again, liturgy group. And they sang songs like liturgical hymn type things. And I was kind of a misfit. Another trip, though, I went with uh, spirit-led people, if you will, for whatever that's worth. Different tribe. Somebody say different tribe. Just a different tribe, same body. And I remember being in the upper room and singing, and all of a sudden, believe it or not, a dove, a big white dove comes in the window that's open above and just kind of circles the, the audience, the group. And I'm sitting here going, am I having an out-of-body experience? Is this, is this really it again? Is, you know, and, and when everybody opened their eyes and saw the bird, the dove going round and round, it was like the Holy Ghost broke out because these were Pentecostal people. You know. But the sound came from heaven. They didn't create the sound. They were just hungry and patient and, and waited and tarried and were obedient. These are some key phrases, I think, to maybe encourage you to, to do all your checking and do all of your um, rehearsing, but then be willing to wait. Because one of the things that is intangible to me is the time. When's God going to show up? How much time do I have? This song's three and a half minutes. I got to do another three and a half minute song, and then there's an offering, and then there's a message for 22 minutes and three seconds. And then... Guys, I went for a decade without seeing an altar call. And I went to churches every other Sunday or at least every other weekend all over America, playing with all kinds of folks. And I went for nearly a decade without seeing an altar call on Sunday morning in big churches across this, this land. Say, well, we don't do them at our church. All I'm saying is I started losing sight of why I was doing what I was doing and leading people into worship but not having fruit of it in front of me, it was very difficult. So let me just take you back for a second and talk, talk to you about kind of how I got where I am, and it, maybe it'll help some. How many pastors do we have again? All right, good. So I grew up in Lyndall Cooley's church. Some of you don't know who that is, but Lyndall was the, the revival worship leader at Brownsville Assembly of God during the Pensacola revival. And I grew up in his dad's church in Red Bay, Alabama, Actually, I didn't grow up there. I ended up there. I came out of a United Pentecostal Church, if we're calling denominations today, and love many of those people, close friends of mine today. But it was not a grace environment. And for those of you who know, it was all rules and regulations. I left the church. I loved God but hated church joined a rock band. That didn't fit either. Then I met Lyndall Cooley. And I played some Chet Atkins music on the guitar because that's kind of how I grew up playing, you know, finger picking, thumb picking in Mississippi, you know. Played a little Chet music for Lyndall one day and, and his, he said, you got to play that for my dad. So I did. He had me play on Sunday. He said, you want to move into the church basement? I did. I moved into the church basement in, in a little cubicle with no windows, for, lived there for seven years. Left the rock band I was in, became a music leader, worship leader. Got in there every, every, every morning, not for seven years, every morning, Pastor Cooley would come to the church at 6 a.m. right over my room. That was my get-up call to come pray. So I walked with Pastor Cooley around the church pews, Every morning for seven years, learn how to pray. 
That does something to you. Does something to your spirit, changes you. And it puts something in you that people, it's an intangible. So I started playing guitar, you know, for the church and leading worship. And <clears throat> one day pastor said, son, you need to, you know, you need to teach some of these kids how to play. I said, yes, sir. So we started teaching music lessons. At first, it was a source of income, I admit. But then I got this revelation, I believe, of the Holy Spirit. You know, son, why don't you just teach them all the same song? Bass players, drummers, keyboard players, guitar. I was playing all those things young. I started playing when I was four years old. So I started teaching the bass players how to play their, their part. And in those days, it was look what the Lord has done and, you know, um, uh, this is the day and all that kind of music. You all remember that? Yeah, of course I do. And every day, 3 o'clock, kids come in out of school. They drop off at the church, and I start teaching them how to play. Well, I started rehearsing them together. I found the best ones, the best bass players, the best drummers, the best, you know, I'm talking 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds. I'm barely 17 or 18, 19 at that point. So I'm teaching all these kids how to play. And um, next thing I know, I've got bands forming. And I put one in children's church downstairs and then went over in the youth building. And then we started moving the better players into the sanctuary. This went on for a decade. That church is equipped today with the kids that I trained 20 years ago. Right? 20, more than 20 years ago. I'm not that young. But I started saying, okay, this is a great model. It works. And it takes a long time. But what it did is it set some things in place and in motion. Some things got set in motion and a protocol got met. Because the best players started playing on Sunday morning. And now my young kids were going, I want to do that. I want to do that. And I had one kid that was, his family was a million or millionaires. And so uh, this kid came and he couldn't play Mary Had a Little Lamb after two years. I was babysitting. It was good money. And then one day he said, uh, Pastor Greg asked me to play in the youth group on, on Wednesday night. I don't, what do I play? I said, well, you've been taking lessons for two years. You can't play Mary Had a Little Lamb without messing up. What are you going to play? Let's think about this. So we sit down and started working on uh, Here I Am to Worship or some kind of little thing, a little simple chord. You can do this. Oh, yeah. He gets up and sings, and the Holy Spirit comes down in the room. They start singing it. He's hooked. Next thing I know, now he's one of the worship leaders. He was with Church of the Highlands for a long time in Birmingham. Now he's at another church plant. These kids come up all over the place, and they, they carry the DNA with them of teaching and training. This also works for lighting and sound. The trouble, I think, or the challenge, I should say, I, I think many times is the territorial part of this. And I love the fact that, that now Planning Center and many um, growth track and other things that we've introduced to the church, what wonderful tools we have now to take the, the, <clears throat> the drama queen out of it a little bit more. Don't you think? Uh, you got guys who've been playing for 20 years and guys who've been playing for three months. But somehow, if they've got the gift and there's a place for them, they can serve. So what I'm seeing, what I guess what I'm saying today is that I'm seeing a, a wonderful trend that we're, we're moving full steam ahead towards something wonderful in the kingdom of God. It's away from personalities and high profiles. And I meet guys all the time who walk up. I've never met them. They're wonderfully anointed young musicians and singers like these guys that are going to take us where we're going because they're on schedule. They're, they're watching the people like Brother Dennis who speak. My, my thing has always been, hey, come on, let's do this for the preachers too. Let's train our pastors and our preachers to speak instead of one guy doing it all the time. Let's empower a whole generation of speakers to open their mouths and speak well and do well in front of an audience. Um, and th then you've got the backing and, and the weight of the anointed ones, if you will. And, and that's part of my word to you today. And I'm just going to, well, it's actually part of my word for Sunday, but I think it's, it, it could be said today that Christ means anointed, right? I mean, you're called Christians. You are also anointed ones. You, you draw from the strength of our head, which is the Lord. But not just him, just like our brother David said, 
not just the Lord, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but that when that's in order, it flows right on down to the senior pastor, which is you and your wife. And there is a weight that you carry. And if you can, if you can disperse that weight fairly and evenly and with wisdom, you can, you can empower a team to do anything you want to do. It's the problems, as you know, is just that from one individual to the next, they're not all equal. They're people. But there's the wisdom part of it. Am I talking to somebody? Are you okay? Now, training these kids and raising up the next generation, standardizing. Pastor talks a little bit about standardizing things. Like me playing through that pedalboard rig. Now, I have an M13, uh, line six. It's a little similar to this, but not the same animal. And I usually play through two big guitar amps, and you guys can thank me later for not bringing those. <laughs> I've been thrown out of a few churches. Can I just say? I've been, I've been asked to leave a few times. And, um, but I usually run two guitar tube apps, you know, to get that warm sound. But I've been to, to churches all over the place. I helped start the ramp uh, down. I have, was a part of the very first ramp, Karen Wheaton's ministry down in Hamilton, Alabama. And I was there a few years ago. They're really busting out the seams. They've got 300 kids in their worship school. It's just rocking. And she's amazing. In the middle of nowhere. So I want to encourage you. You may say, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Anybody here that says, I'm in the middle of nowhere? Anybody like that? That's the way I feel in Mississippi sometimes, except that I keep seeing fruit around the world at 50, almost 50 years old. So I want to encourage you. What you're doing is working. Stay at it. Be Faithful to the work, it's going to pay off. And like David was encouraging me, after the session this morning, he walks into that room and he starts laying his hands on me and encouraging me and saying, if I'm just here for you, I want to deliver this word to you. See, it's not even about this. Maybe his word to me this morning was his purpose for being here. Are, we, are you okay with that? Because the other word I want to leave you with and I don't know how much time I got. I'm going to talk, and then you can ask questions, and I may beat this band. Can I beat the band up if I have time in front of you? Would you give me permission to do that? 145. Okay, I got 15 then. Okay, let's just do this point, and then I'm going to do a little demonstration for you. That may not go well. We'll see. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Philippians 2 talks about having the same point of view, the same state of mind that Jesus had, the same attitude that Jesus had. That he was willing to lay down basically his, his place at the Father. He was lay, willing to lay down his life to save you and to save me and to save the whole world. And, and guys, for years... I taught sessions in churches. I was at Brownsville Revival for a number of years, too. And I taught the kids at the Bible school. I would say things like, a servant without an agenda can never be hurt. A servant without an agenda can never get hurt, but it's not true. Because I found that after 35 years of ministry almost, grew, grew up, in, I mean, my whole life in ministry, what I've really found is that people will use your gifts, but they don't want your government. And when you grow into your government and you begin to grow spiritually, then you have to spread your wings. And it's part, partly the kingdom of God. That's his church, not yours. And maybe you are the one that's to succeed and come after him. But maybe not. Maybe God has something bigger for you. But you got your sights set on that 300-member church that you've put 25 years in. And it should be my place. I should be, by all rights, the person to pastor that church. But I've been by his side for 15 years, 20 years. But God is saying, you really want that? Or do you want something better? So a servant, a true servant, serves, and David hit me with this word back here today. David, thank you. A true servant will serve knowing he's going to get hurt, maybe even die in the process. 
soldiers. Those, those soldier boys going over there in the trenches, those special forces, they go into battle. They go on their mission knowing, I may give my life for this, for my country, for my family. You say it's not that, it's not that intense. Yes, it is. We're fighting for our lives. We're fighting for the kingdom of God. There are souls at stake. There are people that are pulling the trigger and blowing their brains out and taking uh, pain. Do you know that some, it was said that to me recently that 70-some-odd percent of women in America are on some sort of anxiety medicine and or pain meds, pain meds prescription? That's a high number. And you know what it says to me? It says that the enemy has set his crosshairs on, on the, the females, on the women. And it goes all the way back to Genesis. You're going to bruise his head, but he's going to, you know, or his heel, but you're going to crush his head. So the enemy's been trying to reverse that curse from, it, from when it started, has he not? And so I just say this to you ladies, and I've said this in this church, I think, before, but any organization, any whatever, that targets women and, and tries to control and do all that, it's Antichrist. That's a, did I mean to say that at a tech conference? And I'll finish with this. We've got to stop and get the band. Come on, band, get the band up here for a second, two seconds. I was at a church recently, love these people, good friends of mine. And if this goes on the air, it is what it is. But I was in a staff meeting where they said, don't want any more overweight people on the platform on Sunday. And we don't. And, and, and one friend called me and said, Tony, what do I do? They want me, uh, they say, I'm, he's the best guitar player they got. And he's like, they want me to dye my hair because I got gray hair. And I'm 50 years, 55 years old. I f I'm out of place. A veteran. Because we got a market, we've got to package and somehow make Jesus look good. I'm going to tell you something straight. There is nothing that you can do. There is no lighting you can put me in that will help me make Jesus look good. Jesus looks good already. And I don't care if you're 350 pounds or 75. I don't care if you're 75 years old or 17 in skinny jeans and big glasses. I call them goofy goggles. And a beard down here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you look like, how you package yourself. You cannot make Jesus more attractive or less. Do your best and you fit in somewhere. You may not fit on in at this at this church or the next church down the street. There are prophetic bent churches that you may not fit in. There are liturgical churches that this person might not fit in. You come to my church, you might need a pack of Rolades. You go to some churches, you may need a couple of Red Bulls to stay awake. Guy had, guy had a heart attack in one church I was in recently. They came in and got four people before they got the right guy. I know, and we may do the band thing. I don't, I don't think about time, but I was at Brownsville Revival. I was on the back end of what was a revival. I love the players. I love the pastors, the leaders that, that brought that, were part of that revival. They're dear friends. First week I was there, Pastor, I walked through the halls, no leaders in, in, but except for me walking new, one week old, and I heard the F-bomb being dropped in, in the hallway by, a, by a, a staff member, arguing, fussing, been in church every night for five years, six years, angry people, 
hurt people, abused. When you're in the glory, you don't feel that. But when you come out of the glory and Monday morning comes around, as Sister Cooley always said, it's resignation day. The enemy comes and sets up camp in your mind, your heart. And I don't care if you're a camera guy or leading worship. It comes to you too because you're a target of the enemy. But I, I can tell you this. When God moves into a room, it doesn't matter if the guitar is out of tune. It doesn't matter if all the lights are perfect. It doesn't matter if the sound man got it all right. We had an interesting sound man. The church, that church we were in, grew up in. He didn't create feedback, but he sure made it famous. Let's get it all right. But when God moves into the room, and that doesn't have to happen every Sunday and probably won't. It might not happen twice in your ministry. But I remember John Kilpatrick, whom I love from the Brownsville Church, Assembly of God Church. He said, suddenly, suddenly, the Spirit of the Lord entered the room. And that changes everything. He also said there's a window about this big in every service where the Holy Spirit wants to move in and do what he wants to do. But most churches are not willing to pry it open. They try to keep it shut because we've got to get out by 12. Do you know the difference? Do you know the difference? And when has anybody been in a service before where the Holy Spirit just came down and leveled the floor, just leveled everything? Is that the goal every service? It isn't. It should be but it isn't because we can't package that. You can't recreate Pentecost every Sunday morning. We've tried, have we not? But what we can do is create an atmosphere where God is welcome. And when he comes in, it changes everything. You say, how's he come in? I, don't make me the judge. Don't give me the thermometer because I will criticize the postmodern church and go, man, I can't go there. It's not me. It doesn't fit. It feels awkward to me. I don't like being told how many songs to sing and how long to be up there. Or not. I'm done. I really am. But when the Holy Spirit comes into the room, you've got to be willing to let go of all this, everything say, come in, even if it's just a little while, just for a moment, because God can do more in one hour than you can do in a lifetime. And I was going to, and I'll close with this, I quit. I got to quit. So that church I was at, that was so high tech. I was yelling and screaming about the fog machine. It was getting on my nerves. First of all, I, for, first of all, I helped bring in the fog machine when I, in the late 70s, early 80s when, when, when nobody was doing that. And we were the devil church. I got thrown out of a few churches. Did I tell you that? So we, when they brought the haze machine in and laid the room thick with smoke, we, we experimented on this for about two weeks every day. How to get the fog just right so it would be the glory of God. I got frustrated with it. I was like, is this really, is this really what we've come to? The fog machine? The sound, it, it, what is this? What are we doing? And ultimately, a guy walks up that Sunday after the second week, two weeks of frustration. A guy walks up and he says, I'm Jim. I say, hey, Jim, Pastor Tony. He says, I know you, we haven't met yet. I've been coming and sitting back there for months, kind of slipping out because the lights are down. It's dark. You know? And he says, I slip out. He said, but uh, about the second week I was here, while you were singing such and such a song, he said, I got delivered from meth. I've not had it for about nine months now. And he's in his 60s. 
I looked at him, I was like, you're kidding, in this church? Really? You got delivered? That's amazing to me, it really was. I was like, oh, so God is way bigger than your package. He's way bigger than your call, what you do. He's way bigger than your, right? It's not about me, it, it, it's not about you. God's so much bigger than all that. What, the what package you come in. He's about Jim. It's all about Jim. Amen? Pastor, kind of. Thank you all for coming out this week. This is going to be a fun day. This afternoon is going to be really interesting. We'll get to the band later.